Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So, uh, welcome to this lab session. And I would like to give a brief introduction of this course Phonetics and Technology a Broad Overview. This course is about sounds, as the name suggests. So, phonetics and technology. The both derived from the Greek word phone, meaning sounds. So we look at all aspects of sound, not just the physical properties of sounds, but also the representational aspects with regard to sounds. And not just sounds in isolation. We also look at uh, sounds in, in the domain of sentences, which, which we can uh, call intuition. So one of the some of the few last few classes are also about. Uh, Sentence level changes in um, in pitch, which we can call uh, intonation, and which we see that which can be structured in various ways, and we can understand uh, various things about languages as to how statements, uh, questions, um, verses, imperatives, all these are uh, what are the properties of you know those different kinds of sentences, how in terms of pitch level or phrase level changes. Okay, so, and that's the last part of the course. Um, but uh, beginning with the first part of the course, we talked about um, the, uh, the physical properties of sounds. That is, we look at uh, not just articulation. We talk, we talk quite a bit about articulation in this course. That is, the place of articulation manner and various aspects related to larynx. Okay? And then we also look at um, sounds of uh, unfamiliar languages, so which means we also look at sounds that which you may not have encountered before and which are important to uh, know because uh, we have a yeah, because um, the the because the issue of languages disappearing from this world. So uh, if we do not know the diversity which is present in the world's languages, then a lot of knowledge about human uh, languages um, will also be lost along with the loss of languages. Um, hence, we look at unfamiliar sounds, we look at uh, clicks, uh, which are very interesting. We also look at implosives, adjectives. We look at sounds which are familiar to us in uh, the Indian context, that is, retroflexes, which are not very common in the other languages in the world. And we discuss in detail as to how different languages spoken. Uh, in India and also outside, are different um, even in retroflexion, how small differences um, can be seen in Hindi versus Tamil or uh, Telugu. So, um, 
those are the physical properties. Of sound. We also look at acoustics. So we look at the uh, we look at sound waves, how sound waves are different from other kinds of waves, and also we discuss um, the properties of these sound waves. We also discuss how we um, hear sounds, and we also discuss the properties of vowels, which are different from properties of consonants in terms of acoustics. Vowels are uh, uh, very distinct in terms of the formants. Okay. So these are regions of energy which we uh, produce when we produce vowels. And we also discuss how one vowel is different from, other vowel, or from another vowel in terms of acoustic properties of formants, where the first formant, second formant, third formant may be different uh, from one vowel to the other. And these differences are there because of the cavities which are um, inside the mouth when you produce the vowels in the cavities which are responsible for producing the different qualities of vowels and the vowels that, are, uh, that results in the different uh, values of performance and how we can identify, looking at the spectrogram, how we can identify different vowels because the positions or the first uh, or like or the frequencies the first uh, formant versus the second formant, third formant will be different depending on whether the vowel is front or back or a high or low. And also similarly, consonants have acoustic properties which are actually shown in formal transitions. And um, so we uh, discuss acoustics uh, quite a bit in this course, and also we discuss. Uh, how we perceive sound. So perception is also part of this course, not very um, extensively covered because we only try to understand what is relevant for uh, uh, what is relevant for understanding contrasts between sounds. So we have um, included categorical perception, very important when you want to understand how we perceive sounds differently, one sound from the other, why the sound different to us. And what are those properties? So when you try to understand that categorical perception is very important. And apart from uh, from articulation uh, and acoustics and perception, we also look at the representational properties of sound. So what are representational properties? So you can imagine it's um, because we seem to know what we are producing as sounds, there must be another level which is um, which which um, bears the representation of, of this information, right? So as a result, that is a level where uh, which is called phonology. Okay? So phonetic studies the surface properties, phonology studies the the, um, the organization or the representation of the sounds in our um, uh, mental uh, mapping. So, and uh, the various ways of studying these kind of things. So, we look at alternations, we look at uh, various phonological processes, which are, which could be, which could also include alternations, uh, voicing, devoicing, assimilations, etc. And we look at uh, those properties across um, morphemes. So, we look at morphophonology. Um, and we discuss uh, properties in different languages. We, when we're discussing phonology, we discuss an important property of phonology uh, in different languages that is stress. So how stress systems different, uh, differ from one language to the other. That is where in the word or a sentence you will put most emphasis on. What determines what part of the word you put emphasis on. And this is a factor which is different languages and the various principles, constraints affecting the uh, placement of the most of, of the prominent uh, of prominence in, in the world. So, and as I already mentioned, we look at not just uh, the physical and the uh, uh, representational um, aspects of sound, we also go a bit further and also look at intonation and um, we look at prosody. That is, uh, what does it mean to have um, a rise and a fall in a sentence, or rise 
or how do, how do we understand that a question is being asked and those things are very much related to which changes that we um, make as we are producing uh, sentences and this can be studied at the level of sounds because it involves which changes and a lot of information is packed in the way that we uh, use pitch and duration and other prosodic properties to express uh, these, uh, to ex ex express these properties of uh, language. And um, so another important thing which I have also mentioned is that we, uh, we have a, a component in this course which looks at the uh, linguistic diversity and looks at the diversity in sounds and that is, um, uh, that is, I would say, an important part of this course because it uh, deals with an aspect which is not normally covered in plant sonology courses, but we look at the uh, various uh, different possible sounds in the language of the world. We talk about different uh, airstream mechanisms, we talk about uh, different ways of, uh, different contrasts languages, we talk about apical, laminal versus all the coronal contrasts which are possible in different languages and, um, and so uh, and so that we understand that the extent of variety, diversity which is possible in the languages. So this is a brief introduction of the course and uh, you're welcome to ask questions on the components of this course. So uh, there's a question about the question paper. I think uh, you could also asked about the question. The question paper is mostly going to be objective, uh, mostly objective, and um, so it. Uh, the, if there are subjective questions, then it will just expect you to maybe label something or um, show uh, the parts. So, so as you know, we, when we discussed the articulatory system and we have the various parts in, uh, that are involved in the articulatory system, so you might get questions for labeling things. So that is just a very wide hint. I'm not telling you what questions you're going to get, but those are, if it all subjective, then uh, those are the kind of questions you might get. So there's another question, Gitashri, um, since not many like me, uh, are not familiar with in-depth knowledge of phonetics, are really worried about the exam difficulty level, especially the mathematical part. So there's not going to be mathematics for sure. Uh, the only only part where we had a little uh, equation was when we had the formants, right? How the first formant uh, is calculated. That is, and the, the only equations we had were there. But the not uh, we don't have any other. Um, mathematics anywhere else in the course and uh, there may be mathematics involving perception but that's not um, discussed in this course so much. There won't be any mathematical uh, question and uh, so as I said the only part where you have some equations are when we give the formula for the formants, formant 1, formant 2, formant 3. So and then also how um, for instance the high vowel might have a uh, different equation for its first formant. So that's the only part where we have some equations and those are, you are not expected to do calculations based on questions. So, um, yeah, so there's uh, there's hardly any mathematics uh, in this course. As I said, formants, uh, high, uh, high vowels have low F1. So the only reason we have the equations is that we try to explain why high vowels have a uh, low F1 okay? and or why um, uh, low vowels will have a uh, higher F1. So that's 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 the only part where we have equations as I said. So how to improve pronunciation? Um, any exercise for tongue? Um, so uh, I 
I mean, I I don't know exercises, but what I would uh, what I would think is that um, I would think that um, okay, so you can try recording your own speech and try to see where we, we want to improve. I mean, or I would not improve is not a good word here because this, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with uh, your pronunciation. But if you want to change, if you want to have a certain accent, I don't know if you want to. But if you do, what you can do is record yourself and hear and see uh, and and try to uh, uh, see if, if you want to improve any parts. But it's uh, it's not necessary as long as anyone is. Uh, if you are, you you, you can um, uh, convey what you want to say. Uh, Efficiently, I don't think that any improvement is required. But if you are very insistent on learning an accent, then that is one possibility that you can record what you have spoken and compare and see if you want to improve your. So something. Uh, so I, I mean, uh, one one thing that um, uh, that uh, <laughs> that you might want to um, think about is. Uh, uh, so, because you are asking about improving uh, uh, improving pronunciation, so I am a bit perplexed as to uh, how to answer improving pronunciation because I don't know what uh, what you're talking about. But something which is important for Indian English speakers is that we do not put a lot of emphasis on when we're learning the language English. native speakers have a certain stress pattern, right? So uh, certain um, certain syllables are stressed. So and also the uh, and then the allophones, for instance, uh, in stressed initial positions, there, there is aspiration in the consonants like per, 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 the voice ones. So and and those things make a lot of difference in the pronunciation when you are when you are. Um, um, when you're not, uh, you know, and very. Um, Excuse me. And uh, very clearly, um, uh, so Indian English has this uh, typical uh, stress and accent pattern, and native English is, I would say, you know, if you want to think of, um, uh, if you want to think of British English or American English or Australian English, and native English is they have their own stress patterns. I think that's the major part which leads to the difference. In pronunciation, and if you want to adopt any, that is, I would say that's the first um, thing that you should think about. That you know, the stress factor, the emphasis factor, where we are putting the emphasis when we are speaking, okay, and how to be, how the vowels become longer if they are stressed, and how the allophones are different. And uh, strikingly, we have talked about you know um, allophones, and when we talked about transfer, for instance. So that's a, that's a part of this part of the course where we talk about transfer, and we talk about transfer as a, as a phenomenon, which is a, a, which is bringing the allophones of one language to another language. So you, uh, if, if you understood that, then you can understand what uh, you know this thing very clearly. So uh, what we are doing when we are speaking English, so we have very many different Englishes in the countries. So there is Hindi English, there is uh, of course Bengali or whatever, but uh, but what we are doing is that we are bringing the allophones of our native languages while we, um, yeah, you know, while we use the second language, maybe maybe that's English or maybe it could be Hindi for some of the speakers. So that is what you know. That, so if you understand that, you can actually uh, think about it and act on it if you want to. So what we are doing is that we are bringing the allophones of our native languages when we are speaking a second language. So, and if you're alert about that, you know that, okay, I'm, uh, my allophones are, you know, um, uh, so I'm using English in this way because my allophones from uh, whatever language is like this. Or it could be something else also. So that kind of introspection could also help if you want to change anything about pronunciation. But I would say that as long as you are intelligible, uh, it's all good. But if for certain purposes you need a certain accent, then those are things that are that you need to think about.
last minute strategy um, uh, will it be enough if we thoroughly study PPT? Mostly it will be enough. If you think that there are gaps in the PPTs, you can uh, go to your reference books and uh, look up those things. But it is probable that sometimes you're not explaining something a lot because um, you know it may not be required for course. But if you want to understand something more, then you, uh, you, you um, could always go to the reference material. Uh, so thank you, Vidashri. And last minute revision strategy. Uh, yes, so just look at all the, uh, read properly, read, read the main points of the PPTs and if you have any doubts, go to the uh, materials if, if you think you didn't understand something. Yeah. yeah, so you can do that, you can do that. Most of the, most of the questions will be based on the discussions that we had, you know, have been presented. Okay, so uh, uh, questions will not be based on things that we have not presented in the course. Okay, that's very, very clear. I want to make that very clear. Not include questions in the reference books which I have not discussed in the um, in the presentations. Okay. So I think, uh, thank you Nikashri, thank you Ayushi, uh, Muttu, Kumari, will there be any essay type questions? There will be no essay type questions. Uh, any book that you recommend for beginners, uh, be uh, for beginners uh, in linguistics, beginners in phonetics technology, beginners uh, in exactly what? So uh, I think if you explain that question, so uh, are you, uh, are you a student of linguistics? So, uh, phonetics, um, phonology, there is introductory phonology by, um, there is this book by Bruce Hayes, which we have used a lot. And also the books by Ladderfogel, Peter Ladderfogel, which we have used a lot uh, in this course. Yeah. Uh, acoustic phonetics that we, uh, we have used for the material and also the sounds of the world's languages, Latin forget and medicine. So we have used these books for the presentations and um, these are the main, um, there won't be transcriptions. Yeah, so uh, beginners in phonetics and phonology, yes. So, um, if you are more interested in phonology or phonetics, then please look up uh, all, I mean, of course, this is main this little book on acoustic phonetics by uh, P.J. Ladefugit. And then there are other uh, books by Ladefugit also, one on experimental uh, uh, phonetics. And there's, this, and there's sound of the world's languages, which we have used for the um, uh, discussion on sound of the world's languages. But if you're more interested in phonology, then there are, there are a couple of good introductory books. There's this one book uh, by Bruce Hayes, which we have used in this course. Assignment would help in the preparation. Assignments would definitely help in the preparation, yes. Um, so I hope you have uh, done the assignments. And uh, if you have done the assignment, which, have, which means we have uh, read and followed the presentations properly, that's going to really be helpful for you. Yes, so that's what I have just said that uh, assignments will be helpful in the presentation. Um, missed one assignment, any chance to redo it? Um, it's not possible. It's uh, not possible. I just confirmed. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry about that, that you missed one assignment. But doing the assignments, if you if you I can again go back to your assignments and see uh, the kinds of questions it's going to be helpful. And uh, so prepare thoroughly, prepare, look at your um, 
activities properly, if there's any doubt, go to the reference materials to check. And I think that will be more or less um, uh, enough preparation for your um, exam. So, obstruent and sonorant, yes. And uh, so, so, so if you have been, if you have followed the lectures on articulatory phonetics, so you know uh, plosives and fricatives, right? So, for the production of, uh, so let me explain this in a very basic way. For the production of um, stops and fricatives, there involves um, a certain amount of constriction, right? And um, and for the production of sonorants, basically, there is less constriction. But at the same time, nasals are also uh, sonorants because uh, nasals, uh, even though nasals have obstruction, through the nasal cavity, there's, there's no obstruction when, when, this, when it's released, when the air is released through nasal cavity. So that's why nasals are also sonorants. And all the other sonorants have very little obstruction. The level of obstruction is, is less compared to the uh, obstruents, and that's why, and that's how we have sonorants that we have liquids uh, or laterals uh, after the, the um, approximants and nasals as sonorants, and all the others, uh, stops, predators, and africans are obstruents. I hope that's clear. So yes, you will pass, <laughs> you will pass, uh, I'm sure if you are thoroughly reading and doing all the assignments, you will definitely pass, there's no doubt about that. The smallest unit of the sound is a phone or a phone question. So the smallest unit of the sound is uh, of, of a sound is called a phoneme. Okay? But the phoneme, as we have discussed in the course, is a uh, is an abstract uh, is an abstract entity. So whatever appears on the surface is called a phone. But technically, it's always a phoneme which is the smallest unit of the uh, uh, smallest unit. Last year's papers, can they get last year's papers? I don't, uh, I, I'm not sure about, uh, I'm not sure about last year's papers, whether you can get them. Um, uh, there is no information given to us about that uh, because we have not received any, any information about uh, making available last year's uh, question papers or previous year's question papers. So that you will have to find out uh, from uh, your NPT, uh, um, I think, um, someone uh, who answers questions, FAQ or somewhere, somewhere there, you will find out that because uh, we don't have any of, any of that information, it's not in our control. So the smallest unit, I think I have already answered that. Yeah, so uh, yeah, please find out from the NPT um, exam or if those uh, question papers are available and uh, yeah, as I said it's not uh, we don't have access to anything uh, regarding the questions and exams I mean the previous year's questions and previous years uh, Exams because it was objective, you only saw the results we did not know about. So it is administered centrally, the examination. So I have more questions.
apical tip of the tongue. So, um, apical is tip of the tongue, laminal is the tongue blade. So, so when you move the tip of the tongue towards the uh, back of your teeth, then you have an apical uh, dental sound, right? So, if you, if you slightly, uh, if, if the region uh, which is slightly behind the tip of the tongue, that would be your uh, laminal. So, so languages seem to make a difference between that. So some sounds are uh, apical, some sounds are laminal in different languages. So there's a difference in whether you use the tip of, I mean, sound uh, is produced using the tip of the tongue or the tongue blade. Okay. So as you have seen in your um, lectures, so the tongue would have tongue tip, tongue blade, tongue body, and the back of the tongue. And the tongue can be moved. It can be divided into four parts. Right? So tongue, the apical part is the tip of the tongue. And sometimes dental sounds are produced not on the tip of the tongue, but the tongue blade. Okay? And that's how uh, uh, sounds can be different in languages. Whether the tip is used or the blade is used. So, uh, because you asked about uh, laminal and apical, I also want to uh, talk about how I think the apical laminal distinctions we talked about when we discussed some of the words, right? So, how different languages uh, could have so much diversity in the kinds of sounds that uh, can, uh, the language can have in its inventory. Right. So that's where we discuss apical and laminal. And in, uh, there are these diagrams where I remember we have shown that it's, if uh, the sound is dental or if it's alveolar, it's the tongue tip can move to the alveolar uh, region or tongue tip can move to the uh, dental region or tongue blade can move to the dental region or tongue blade can move to the alveolar region. So there's four possibilities of this. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, I'm glad that you have your conclusions clear. So, um, as I was saying, apical and um, apical alveolar. It could have apical alveolar, it could have laminal alveolar, it could have dental, uh, apical dental, or laminal dental. Now, interestingly, as uh, you have seen, there are languages which have contrast between dental and alveolar sounds. But when they have that contrast, not very often do languages have both apical dental and apical alveolar, or both apical alveolar, uh, laminal alveolar and laminal dental. So those, uh, uh, that doesn't happen. So languages, if there's a contrast, then there is um, the apical alveolar and, uh, and laminal dental. So, so glottal and velar sounds, yes. Uh, glottal sounds are produced in glottis, obviously. Right, velar sounds are produced in the velar region. And in the glottis, so remember, so, uh, you have seen the glottis in all the presentations. The glottis is an organ which uh, is responsible for producing the voicing um, in most of the sound, bringing the voicing contrast or bringing voicing in, in the sound. So the, the 
it, it, it vibrates, right? We have seen the videos also. It's a vibration of the cords. It's a it's an organ made of lots of cartilage and muscles, and it has these flaps which can vibrate and it will produce, uh, and that vibration will produce uh, voice even sounds. Now, um, the, the, the vocal folds are, are such that it's not just the vibration which can produce voicing, but additionally, when they come together in extreme form of um, uh, like, in, 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 obstruction can be created. So, as we know, how are stops created? How, how do we have stops? We have stops because there is complete obstruction and release. Now, in the glottis region, when you will have a glottal stop, for instance, the folds will come completely together and release. As a result, we will have we have um, uh, we have glottal stop, right? And however, um, so so the tongue is not involved at all when we have glottal sound. So the glottis itself is an organ with these vocal folds. It's a muscular organ with lots of cartilage, and it can produce sound. So it can produce some, uh, give some quality to sounds, or produce stops like glottal stops, right? Or we have produce voice, or even our um, pitch, right? Um, the the rate of so immediately I have a next question F0, F1, F2, which is related to this. Actually, what we have when we have F0, right? Rate of vibration of the vocal folds. So the, the rate at which the vibrate while producing uh, all our language, right? So that is the pitch, that, that's, that's the psychoacoustic um, correlate of what we call fundamental frequency. Psychoacoustic correlate of fundamental frequency is the pitch, okay? Fundamental frequency is not as we have said. So what is that? That is the rate of vibration of the vocal folds, right? So uh, the glottis region, um, the, the, the area of the glottis, the glottis itself as an organ produces different sounds and also gives quality to other to everything that we produce, right? Voicing, pitch, and additionally, there are other glottalized sounds, the language which can produce glottalized sounds, right? Which is a secondary articulation. So glottis is involved in a lot of um, uh, the production of sounds. So, it's, it's only uh, natural because uh, the, our glottis is supposed to be the main organ which makes the difference between us and other species in the way we use language. It's a lowering of the glottis which actually finally evolved, humans evolved to start speaking the way we did. So the glottis is a huge role in the production of language as such. Okay. So velar is different. Velar is just back of tongue making a constriction at the velic region. So that's Pillar, right? But for glottis, it's an organ by itself. Okay, so that's a huge difference between Miller and and uh, glottal sounds. Uh, if that was the question, I hope that is clarified. And coming to F F not F one F two. F not is as I just said the rate of vibration of the vocal folds. F one and F two different. Okay, F one and F two is not about the rate of vibration of just the vocal folds. It's much more complex than that. Okay, so why is it complex? Because uh, now we're going to talk about F1, F2, we have to talk about the um, source filter. What is the source? Okay. Source is the glottis region at the, 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 and the air which is pushed out to the source of the source, that is the glottis. Okay, now um, F0 is what happens in the glottis itself. Now F1 and F2 is not exactly about what is happening in the glottis. But the sound which is um, air which is pushed out and which is given some shape, right, in the filter. What is the filter? The filter is our uh, vocal tract that acts as the filter. Our entire, uh, what we have in the vocal tract, these are also our, inside our mouths, right? These, this is actually a resonance cavity. Think about a musical instrument in strings, and then there you have, um, suppose, a guitar, and you have that box which gives that resonance cavity. So it's not exactly the same, but think about it as an analogy. Okay? So when the air is pushed out through the source, that is the glottis, 
and it's given some shape by this uh, by this resonance cavity, which is our mouth, right? This resonance cavity has different resonant areas, res areas of resonance, and that's why it's called a filter. Okay, and as a result, depending on where the filtering happens, that's why uh, you will have a particular, um, um, you know. Uh, so suppose F1, F1 is around um, 230 hertz if it is a, uh, if it is a uh, high power, let's suppose E, so F1 is 230 hertz, what does that mean? Uh, that means around that frequency there is a lot of energy and that, why does that energy, why would you have that much energy at, uh, around that frequency? Because the air which is pushed out from the from the source is highlighted, it gets its energy becomes very much um, you know boosted at around 230 hertz. So that's why E has this particular quality, which is different from R, which has a higher F1 than um, E, which is a lower F1. So it is boosting of that. Um, you know, energy range around 230 hertz, which the resonance cavity does, which is inside our mouth, and that's why we have suppose F1 at 230 hertz and um, F2 um, at suppose um, you know for another bowel, maybe 500 hertz. So why is F1, F2 at 500 hertz for another bowel, say uh, <coughs> air or something? Because at that frequency, the energy is getting boosted because of resonance cavity. Okay? So F F not uh, F0 is completely different phenomena from completely different in the sense of course we are talking about frequencies that way it's not different. But what is different is that what you're when you're talking about F not we are talking about the rate of vibration of the vocal cords. When you're talking about F1 and F2, we are talking about the resonance cavities um, the inside the mouth. So and there and the particular frequency is getting highlighted because you know uh, because if we say E then uh, it's a high power it's a it's a front power it's using particular cavities inside the mouth and those resonance areas are getting highlighted because of the way the power is produced. I hope uh, this is this is uh, slightly clearer than what uh, was than what you understood. Or if there are any other queries, you can ask. But I think uh, so we have some more time if you want to ask anything. So, uh, so yes, F naught is just a rate of vibration of the vocal cords. F one and F two are the result of the way the resonance chambers are filtering the sound which is coming out from the glass. So when you are producing a high vowel, suppose, um, suppose a high front vowel, you can think about, so you can imagine that your tongue is, uh, you know, uh, jutted out towards the is jutting out towards the first front part of your mouth, and um, it is um, it is high, so it is uh, quite it is it is placed along the palate. So the the cavities which are being highlighted for producing that vowel is different from R, where you, you can imagine your your tongue goes lower and uh, uh, the back cavity becomes highlighted when you're producing. Uh, when you're producing uh, uh, vowels which involve the back cavity, right? And then as a result, your F2 and F3, uh, F2, F2 will, sh will, will show those things. So when you have, for instance, the, the um, back vowels like O or even R, so you can see, what, when you see, what you can see from the F, F F1, F2, F3 um, uh, diagrams there is that um, F1 is low for high vowel and keeps on um, going up. So as the vowel becomes uh, lower and lower, 
So you have an inverse relationship and as the vowel becomes more lower, F, F1 just keeps going up to the extent that F1 and F2 are very close together in the, uh, in the uh, back, high back vowels, right? Uh, in, in, sorry, not high, the back vowels. So uh, why does it happen again? Because uh, the cavities uh, involved there, the back cavity and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, when the production of the high vowels, uh, the, the, sorry, uh, high, uh, high back vowels, production of uh, the, the, the back cavities involved, and as a result, the F2 will be much closer to the uh, uh, to the F1. <clears throat> and uh, that is what's showing up in the F1 and F2, F3, that because of the different uh, cavities involved, which are all resonance chambers, they are all highlighting the, uh, their intrinsic, basically, their intrinsic uh, frequencies. So whether that's 230 hertz or 500 hertz, it's the air which is being filtered. The source filter diagram very nicely shows that that when your source the source air is modulated by the resonance chambers, it also pre it pre preserves some of the qualities of the uh, source, but the filter also gives additional qualities because of the resonance chambers. And that's how we have F1, F2, F3, which is different from F0. So if there are any more questions, you can ask me. And um, before wrapping up, I think I will wish everyone uh, my best wishes for your exam. And um, hopefully you all do very well. Thank you, Gitashri. I hope you enjoyed the course. Yeah, if, if, if there are no more questions, then we can end this session. And I really enjoyed answering your questions. And hopefully, um, I will see you somewhere in some linguistics uh, conferences. Thank you.